check. Okay. All right. Okay. Hey, good morning. Welcome. I've started the recording. Um, hello, Arila. Hi, Nina. I hope you can, you guys can hear me. Okay. Um, and also see me. All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, just give me a quick yes or a thumbs up if you can, if you can hear me clearly. All right, okay. Great, uh, let's pray and we'll get started uh, this morning. Father, we submit this time into your hands, this class, this hour, this session into your hands, Lord. Uh, Father, even as we look to your word again, Jesus, uh, Father, your word says you are the word. Lord, I pray that there would be a, another beautiful revelation as we read through the scriptures, meditate on your word, Father. Uh, Lord, I pray that we will see things that uh, that we have never seen before, Jesus, of you, of who, of who you are, of your goodness. So, um, Holy Spirit, we give you complete control to come and do what you do best. You speak to us, you teach us, you are the spirit of wisdom. You pour out your wisdom over us so that we would understand the things of heaven, things of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Um, so what I want to do at uh, this time is, uh, so we've covered quite a lot of uh, content, right? Um, and this is one of the subjects which is important. All the subjects are important. Uh, uh, but I, what I wanted to do at this time, at this point, is just do a quick recap of everything that we've covered. Like, um, not a, not just a summary, but then we just go through the notes and everything just to refresh uh, everything what, what we've covered. And we can carry on from where we left off, okay? Um, so I want to just go back to chapter one itself and I just, um, just to refresh, uh, you know, a memory <laughs> of, by start by looking at um, the eight biblical reasons as to uh, why we need to minister healing and deliverance, right? Uh, you guys with me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, one of the first things we looked at, um, one of the first biblical reasons for to minister healing and deliverance um, is uh, it reveals the nature of God, right? It reveals the reality and the nature of God, right? Um, and we want to do that. Uh, you know, when we minister, when we pray for an individual or for anyone, uh, we show them who this God is in our lives, right? And uh, that that He is real and that He is beautiful. Uh, we saw multiple scriptures, but one of the key scriptures which is revealed is Exodus fifteen twenty six, right? Uh, that is His covenant name. That He is, I am the Lord who heals you isn't it um remember when moses asks uh, god when god tells him to go to pharaoh he said like lord who shall i send that sent me god says i am that's it right uh, i am who i am isn't it and the, here this is the covenant name and he says i am the lord who heals right he heals he restores that is who he is Okay, uh, so that's one of the first biblical reasons we saw that uh, ministering healing and deliverance reveals God's nature. Uh, it reveals God's greatness, um, right? Uh, in John chapter 2, verse 11, it says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. Right? It manifested his glory. It began to display his glory, his greatness, his wonders. So um, people, please remember. So when we minister uh, in healing and deliverance, we reveal the wonders of God. Right? We reveal God's greatness. Okay. Um, I was recently reading uh, the book of Acts in chapter 2. Right? We were reading about the day of Pentecost. Right? And uh, how most of the time we give importance to um, that, okay, everybody were baptized by the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues, right? Uh, which is true, uh, absolutely did. But there's one statement uh, where another person who says, hey, look, these people are praying in, in our tongue, in the language that we know, but they are declaring all the works of God. So one of the first things that men did when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit was they began to declare in other tongues the greatness of God and the works of God. Right? Are you with me? So miracles reveals God's greatness. And third point was miracles demonstrate God's 
compassion, right? Not uh, we don't see in a single place where Jesus was not moved in a compassion for, for all those who needed healing, isn't it? Yes or no? Right. So how much more should we be moved, isn't it? If we are to represent Jesus, if we are called Christians, uh, we need to move, walk the way Jesus did, isn't it, guys? Yep. Okay. So what's the fourth one? Okay. Miracles have a powerful effect on people, especially on those who do not believe. Okay. So uh, it has an effect on people. That means it gets people's attention, right? When something happened, okay, something is happening on the road. We'll all go look at a fight. Uh, we stand. Sometimes we might not do anything, but we just want to fold our hands and look. It's like, hey. Our brothers are fighting over there, look, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so this one gets our attention and it got people's attention for the good reasons. And also, you know, Pharisees and Sadducees, they were not happy about what was happening. But it got their attention. Uh, and the second thing we see that the miracles act as a signpost, right? Uh, again, we've uh, spoken about this, that miracles in itself is not the destination. Signposts, like on the highway, you see the signpost, that's what miracles are, right? It acts as a signpost that points to God, yeah? Okay, and then what else did we do? Uh, it brings about conviction of sin. Ministering, healing, and deliverance, it brings about conviction of Sin. Okay, so let's very quickly in senior notes. Um, it talks about from First Corinthians chapter fourteen, verse twenty-four and twenty-five. First Corinthians chapter fourteen, verse twenty-four and twenty-five. It says, "But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convicted by all. He is convicted by all." And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So anytime a supernatural happens, every time a kingdom of God invades a room, right? Again, I want to just go back to the day of Pentecost. Uh, now, day of Pentecost is what? Pentecost is what? It's a festival of? You're right. It's a festival of harvest. <laughs> That's the right answer, guys. <laughs> so, um, so 50 days before the day of Pentecost is the festival of emerging crops, the first early crops. Okay, 50 days before the day of Pentecost is the festival of emerging crop, first fruits, right? First crops. So, 50 days later is the festival of a harvest. So its imagery on the day of Pentecost was that, OK, there was a huge harvest going to happen, but it was going to be the harvest of the souls, isn't it? And that's why when Peter, Peter began uh, preaching, how many people were added to the church? 3,000. And I mean, that's the number that's given, right? Could be more, isn't it? Are you with me? Right? Um, and so it brings about conviction of sin. That means these 3,000 people were convicted and they're like, OK, all those who people did not believe, like 50 days before that, okay, they said, okay, this man needs to die. They crucified Jesus. Uh, later, they began, okay, hey, uh, they believed that, you know, uh, they were convicted of their sin and they believed that uh, Jesus is the man. Okay, and then it brings people to a decision point, which we also spoke about. Uh, let's go on. Um, Jesus gave importance to miracles. I really hope you are with me so far. Okay, we are just doing a, not a quick recap, but we are doing a recap. <laughs> okay, um, are you all doing okay? Everybody online? Okay, sorry, I look at the camera. Every <laughs> I hope you guys are following um, and doing all right. Um, if you're bored, say amen. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the fifth one was uh, the importance Jesus gave to miracles, right? Uh, just a couple of scriptures, again, to remind us from John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, it says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have ha you may have life in His name. John chapter twenty one verse twenty five it says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Okay, that's John chapter twenty one. Um, verse 25. Um, there's one more scripture that I want to read um, if I can find it. Okay. Okay. No, I can't find it. So there's a, there's a passage of scripture where it says uh, when Jesus was questioned about his authority and his, authentic, his credibility, uh, then Jesus says, okay, hey, if you don't believe in me, believe in the works that I do. That he pointed to the miracles uh, and said, okay, believe in the miracles that I do because I do what I see the Father do. Right? And so Jesus gave uh, incredible importance to uh, the signs and wonders um, that he did. Okay, the sixth reason is the kingdom comes with power and authority that talks about the kingdom of God. And let's move on. The seventh one, the seventh reason is the gospel is to be preached with accompanying signs. <clears throat> okay, the gospel is to be preached with accompanying signs. That means you're not just to preach the gospel, but it's supposed to be supported with signs and wonders. Um, and we have a bunch of scriptures mentioned there. And then finally, the eighth reason was miracles encourage people to believe for more of the supernatural right so as soon as we see that okay this god can do the impossible the miracle uh, miracles and it encourages people to believe more so that's the eighth reason um okay i hope you're with me so far let's move on quickly now uh God's desire, the supernatural through every believer. One of the things that we emphasize in this uh, course, in this chapter, is that every believer is equipped to minister divine healing and deliverance. Are you with me? Okay, every believer is equipped to minister divine healing uh, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Uh, we see that in page 24, 25. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the hard copy, it's pages 24 and 25. Um, the Holy Spirit has been given to all. Uh, the same Holy Spirit that Jesus, uh, that worked through Jesus, uh, has been given, has been made available to all of us. Uh, how many of you were all were at church yesterday, Central or anywhere? Okay, hey, it was about what? What was the sermon about? Like I don't know what the sermon was about. <laughs> Baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, <laughs> I hope you paid attention and learned something. Okay, uh, and then another thing what we looked at was why are we not demonstrating uh, more of God's power? Right? That was another important or frequently asked question. Uh, why are we not demonstrating more of God's power? First one, lack of, lack of knowledge. Okay, uh, lack of knowledge of what? Okay, Nina, thank you. Uh, yeah, John chapter 10, verse 37, 38, yeah. Why are we not demonstrating more of God's power? Sorry, huh? That we don't believe? Or we don't have the knowledge that every believer can do? Yeah, okay. Sorry? Wrong teaching, okay. So we don't demonstrate more of God's power, one, because of the lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge that our God is good. Lack of knowledge that our God is a healer. Lack of knowledge that God is willing. We think, okay, God is not willing, you know. Uh, uh, and the wrong teaching concerning the supernatural, that it was all ended when the last disciple, John, when John died, everything was ended, right? Or, or uh, sometimes we say, okay, this must be the will of uh, God for me to suffer through this. 
Uh, have you heard people say that? I think it's the will of God for me to suffer through this. So, but the same people will also go to the hospital. Right? It's like, okay, if, if it's the will of God for you to suffer, why don't you keep suffering and why you want to go to the doctor to be healed? Isn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, wrong teaching. Um, okay, a third one. Leaving the ministry, miracle ministry to only a few people, like those who are called for healing ministry uh, and whatnot. Okay. Um, but once again, to reiterate the point that everyone can minister in healing and deliverance, including Vimal. Right? Amen, guys? Yeah, all right. Everybody said amen. You didn't say amen. <laughs> yeah. OK, the fourth one, replacing the supernatural with modern substitutes. Um, we want to give importance to everything else but to move in the supernatural, right? Simple as that. That's the only point. And the fifth one is unwilling to press in till we see more of his power displayed. Right? One of the points that we remember uh, saying was that everything Jesus did, he did it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? Yeah? Now, we are talking about Jesus. Son of God. If he needed <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more should we? Right? We as Christians uh, have to be absolutely honest. We are very comfortable in our own little lives, complacent, you know, very happy, you know, going to church on a Sunday and having a wonderful lunch on a Sunday afternoon, family time, all of that is done. After that, Talega. Bindas, right? We don't we don't feel the need to be a witness to the people around us. We don't feel the need to press in like Jesus pressed in. Right? Time and time again in the Bible, we will see that early in the morning Jesus would go away and spend time in prayer. Are you with me? So if Jesus did everything he did with the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more should you and I go after this? which has been made available to us. We act like, oh, it is something that we can't achieve at all. Are you guys with me? Yeah, so unwilling to press in. And uh, other old blocks, such as the supernatural, uh, I mean, of past uh, experiences of failures and will, not willing to take uh, risks, et cetera, et cetera. OK, all right. Um, let's move on to. Ugh. Okay, we spoke about all this. Let's go to the next chapter now. Chapter 2, God's Word on Healing. Okay, God's Word on Healing. Um, the source of sickness, disease, and ailments. What was the first reason we saw? Man's disobedience, isn't it? Uh, what 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 was the disobedience? Are you with me, hey, hey, Nickel? You okay? Any questions? Any questions so far, guys? If I've gone, to, I'm doing this because I feel like I went too fast in the last classes. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, does anybody have any questions or in any language? Someone will translate it for me. <laughs> you get okay, Vimal, Francis? No, I did for you. Pinne. <laughs> Understood everything. Eh? <laughs> okay. So God's word on healing. <clears throat> the first thing we saw was man's disobedience. Where did this begin? <clears throat> the fall of man, right? the fall of Adam, right? When he disobeyed, when uh, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, uh, that made way for the sin to enter into the world, isn't it? Uh, and then from from there on, everything fell down like a house of cards, right? Uh, everything was corrupted. Our bodies were corrupted. The creations were corrupted. Uh, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and 23, right? Uh, we looked at the, the uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, 23, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And we come down to verse 23. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves 
groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. And then in parallel, we looked at another scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1, 5, verse 53 and 54, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it talks about that one day our mortal body will go away and we will be given immortality. All the corruption will go away and we will be given incorruptible bodies, right? So we looked at that, man's disobedience. I mean, now remember, we're looking at the source of sickness and disease. Do you, you guys know that there are sickness and disease in the world, right? It's like, well, sir, what is this? All of a sudden, you're asking a question like this. You guys know, right? You know, it's serious. You know, people die out of you know, deadly diseases. Yes or no? And, and all of that should kind of open our eyes to the seriousness of fall. Are you with me? And the power that we've been given. So we'll get to that, right? And um, so verse 2, uh, sorry, verse two. <laughs> point 2. Satan's activity and direct involvement of demonic spirits, right? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the second half of it says, all who were oppressed by the devil, right? So God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay, you see that the first line itself, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and with power, who went about doing good. So because he was anointed um, with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Okay, so incurable diseases, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et um, and then the third point we saw uh, that can harm the sources of sickness is natural causes. Uh, again, when we don't uh, steward our bodies, when we don't take care of our bodies uh, and, you know, uh, eat too much sugar. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, those all lead to natural causes. And then another important question, does God send sickness? Okay, let's move on to the next point. And this, okay, uh, one of the, uh, another thing we looked at was how do we understand difficult passages in the Bible? Right. Uh, we looked at, OK, there's one scripture that says God is light in him. There is no darkness. And then there is this psalm that says, OK, he's, uh, he, he, uh, his canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. It's like, what is this? Um, you know, we went through difficult passages, right? A lot of those examples. But what was one key point that you need to remember? Yeah, Jesus is the perfect theology. Now, if you don't understand all these difficult passages, but if you understand Jesus, that is more than enough. Why? Because he is the perfect theology, and God's best is revealed in Jesus, right? In the person of Jesus. God's best, his nature, his reality is revealed in the person of Jesus, right? Um, Okay, so we looked at that, and then we begin. We began to look at the basis for ministering, healing, and deliverance. Okay, basis for ministering. So, what does that mean? Basis for ministering. What do like? We went through three point, three different points, but basis for ministering means what? The basic steps for ministering, right? The importance of what are the different things that we have to minister in healing and deliverance? OK, so the first thing is God's nature. We come back to that point that he is a Jehovah Rapha. OK, um, you as when you pray for an individual, you begin to pray, believing that he is the healer and he wants to heal. Right? He absolutely wants to see this person made whole. Are you with me? That is the first step, the first basis for ministering, healing, and deliverance. No matter what the condition is, what, whatever the disease is, you might not even understand the name of the disease. Right? There are so many <laughs> names of the diseases that we don't know. 
we don't care, but I know one name that is high above every other name that is enough. Isn't it? Yes or no? Right? OK. So that reveals God's nature. OK? So that's the first thing, the basis of ministering, healing, and deliverance. And the second thing is, <clears throat> the second one, the basis for ministering, healing, and deliverance is the cross. OK? Um, Matthew quotes from Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, and says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And, but Isaiah says in the previous page, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Right? And so we looked at that one word called grief. G-R-I-E-F-S. Griefs. Okay? The Hebrew meaning for that word grief is sickness, disease, malady, uh, and sorrows. Everything is into that one word. And it says that Jesus took it all. He took our sins, our griefs, our sorrows uh, on himself. And by his stripes, we are healed. Okay, the cross. And then we looked at the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the payment for our redemption. Right? You and I were dead in sin. Ephesians chapter 2 says that, right? We were dead in sin. What, sin, again, we looked at, uh, I asked you all what the definition of sin is. Isn't it? it is a flaw in design, right? And another thing what sin does is it separates. Okay? What does it do? It separates. Okay, remember what the first thing God asks Adam after the after Adam had sinned. What does God ask? Adam, where are you? There's so many things hidden in that. It doesn't doesn't mean that God didn't know where Adam was. What sin does is it separated our spirit from God's spirit. And so with Jesus, you know, when God asks, Adam, where art thou? It's like, where is your spirit? I can't find it. Seems like it's being separated. Are you with me? Like a dislocated shoulder being separated. And so John 3.16, when it says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't mean how long you're going to live. Right, because after you die here on this planet, you are going to continue to exist. You are going to continue to exist, be it in hell or in heaven. That is not what eternal life means. Eternal life means that your spirit is now being reunited with his spirit. Are you with me? Okay, so that is what the blood of Jesus did. It is a payment, redemption. You were bought with a price. Are you with me? David says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Right, And time and time again, we see in the Gospels that Jesus will go after the lost sheep. Yes or no? He keeps using this, this uh, imagery of a sheep and a shepherd. Yes? Now, sheep was an asset. That means it's a, what do I say? It's a property. You had to give money to buy the sheep. It was bought with a price. Are you with me? And so when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he's saying so many things. And one of the things that he's saying is, I am bought with a price. My shepherd redeemed me. He purchased me. And now today, when we say the Lord is my shepherd, we mean a lot of things. And one of the things that we mean is that I am brought with a price. I've been redeemed. He paid 
the price for me and that price is his blood are you guys with me now if these two reasons yeah sorry Anand, yeah yeah you want me to explain one more time okay yeah so most of the time i mean when when i when, uh, say i've heard christians talk about I mean, say, not necessarily preachers, but just general conversation. When we talk about eternal life, we talk, we think it's about the longevity of life. Like even after. That means we have only one thing in mind. When we talk eternal life, I'm going to heaven. Like the continuation of existence. So eternal life is really does not mean that you're how long you continue to live. Because after you die, like I said, you're going to continue to live, exist in hell or in heaven, right? We saw the rich man cried out because he was thirsty. Could someone dip a little water and, you know, wet my brow, wet my lips? That was in hell, right? He continued to exist even after he died, right? And you will continue to exist in heaven, like if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and whatnot. But the eternal life is the moment, right? Right now, when you believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, your spirit is being reunited with the Spirit of God, and he begins to dwell in you. John chapter 4, verse 14, he says that when you believe in me, I am in him like a spring or fountain. Are you with me? So he, your body, your heart becomes your temple, his temple, and he dwells in you. Right? It, that's all it is. The eternal life is him dwelling in us, in us, that our spirit being reunited with his spirit. Are you with me? Yeah? We'll talk more about this. Is that okay, guys? Okay, now remember, we are talking about the basis for ministering healing and deliverance. Now, if we just had the cross and the blood to minister healing and deliverance, it is more than enough. Are you with me? Are you saying? You get what I'm saying? If we just had these two things to minister healing and deliverance, it's not just enough, it is more than enough. But our God is so good that He's given us even more power. What has He given after the after the cross and after the blood? Sorry, His Word, right? Uh, God's power is revealed in His Word. He created the worlds with His Word, right? And we see that in Psalm 107, verse 20, He sent His Word and healed them. Right? He sent his word and he healed them. So the word, uh, and again, we looked at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and 22. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Okay, so his word is healing, it's medicine, it, it delivers us, it, it's a remedy for our flesh. Are you with me? Right? So when we minister the word of God, it builds our faith, it releases power. Are you with me? Um, one of the important scripture that I want to share, it's in the notes, is from First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. What Paul is saying is, when you heard the word of God, you received it as a word from God. You just you don't that means you don't read your Bible like you read your newspaper. <laughs> With me. You don't read your Bible like you read your newspaper. Newspapers, what is the are the words of men? Right. I'm just using that as an example, guys. So Paul is very encouraging to the uh, people of to the church of Thessalonica. Okay, um, so there's power in God's word, uh, and He's given us that authority to release it. Okay, and we looked at a bunch of scriptures. Uh, that's where we stopped in the last class. And uh, now there's the next point we look at 
the basis for ministering healing and deliverance the spirit's power okay the holy spirit's power okay um now i know we we all listened to the sermon yesterday because you're all very good <laughs> i'm just kidding i am not talking about those who don't come to central okay uh one of the things that we learned was the way john the baptist introduces jesus how did he introduce there are two instances the way he, you know, he introduces differently one of the things he first says is behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world we believe that right yes or no <laughs> we believe that jesus is the lamb of god who you know who died for our sins and to take away the sins of the world but the same john the baptist in matthew chapter 3 verse 11 also said i baptize you in water but there is one who is coming after me who will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire most of the times we ignore that we believe in the lord jesus christ as the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world but the same john the baptist also introduced jesus as saying okay hey you know what i baptize you with water but the one who comes after me whose sandals i am not worthy to untie he will baptize you with spirit and with power so time and time again in the scriptures we see that everything jesus did right he did is the power of the holy spirit isn't it uh, look at uh, let's look at a couple of scriptures just for our um, sake luke chapter 4 verse 17 and 19 can someone read that please from the notes Amen. Thank you. So that was, uh, it begins by saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Amen. And Luke chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Now it happened on teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee. Okay, pause. Who had come out of every town of galilee judea and jerusalem okay all these guys left their jobs okay like remember one point it says it it gets people's attention yeah that's what i was talking about <laughs> it definitely got people's attention they left their jobs like they had nothing better to do just to come and see what this fellow is talking about to find fault in him but then see what it says and the power of the lord was present to heal them what is this power it's talking about the power of the holy spirit right the holy spirit is power guys right everybody say power okay how many of you here drive car okay drive how many of you here drive a car yeah okay so yeah three of you okay it does anybody online drive car okay. <laughs> okay so we see that holy spirit is power isn't it now uh most of the cars today have power steering you know what power steering is uh, you can turn the car with one finger oh very it's like butter is like yeah you know what i'm talking about but have you seen uh the olden days cars manual steering right I tried driving a nano with manual steering and it was hard. Have you seen one of these lorry guys from those days, you know, who like tried to turn like, you know, like one big thing, you know, it's like all the muscles are just built by just turning a lorry. It is hard. Like guys, I remember driving also a Maruti 800. It's a small car, isn't it? But it did not have a power steering. That was hard. <laughs> Because the car is heavy, it's a heavy vehicle, isn't it? It's very hard to maneuver it. But what does a power steering do? It lets, just lets you move with ease, like, okay, aram say, you know, in the traffic. 
when we say that Holy Spirit is power, without Him, life becomes difficult. It becomes hard to navigate life. But when He empowers us, He gives us the ability to navigate through all the difficulties, through challenges, to minister healing and deliverance with absolute ease, like a knife cutting through butter. Are you with me? Right, And so this is the power the scriptures are talking about. And then in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Amen? Um, and so... Um, where is, is there another point? Okay. Uh, can you turn the page? We look at uh, some of the scriptures in Mark chapter 5, verse 30. All these scriptures are in your notes. I'm just going to read them a few for our understanding. Mark chapter 5, verse 30, it says, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And Luke chapter 6, verse 19, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. It must have been a beautiful experience, no? Like whoever got to touch and then just feel electricity pass through their bones. I've uh, been crazy. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. It says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen. Um, so all of this is to remind us and tell us that, okay, if Jesus, once again, he did everything what he did with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are anointed to minister like Jesus. Amen? We are anointed to minister like Jesus. Um, so Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Okay, I'll just pause uh, there for today. I think we've covered enough. Uh, and I want to co uh, conclude this session and, and reminding us a very familiar point that this same Holy Spirit that Jesus functioned with. Now we talk about the Trinity, right? What's Who are the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now in Genesis 1-1 when we say, in the beginning, God... The word used there is Elohim, which is a plural. We say oh God, which it just seems like okay, just one being or one person. The Hebrew word there is Elohim, which means plural. That means in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This that means the Holy Spirit was present. And this same Holy Spirit who was in the beginning, you know, when the creation of the world has been given to you and to me. Can you imagine the power that you and I have been freely given? Right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 says, We received the gift of the Holy Spirit by faith. You don't have to roll on the ground, pour something on yourself, walk on fire, go through some thorny stuff and whatnot. Nothing. You receive by faith. This same power that was present in the beginning of the creation, the same power that was with Jesus, has been made available for you and for me. That actually makes you a superhuman, you know that? 
<laughs> Are you guys with me? Yeah, you learned something? I know we did a summary and a recap quite extensively, but uh, that is intentional. OK, and I hope it was uh, quite a refreshing reminder. OK, so let's pray uh, and we'll close the session. All right, Father, we thank you for the session. We thank you for your word, Lord. Holy Spirit, uh, we thank you that you have been made available for us to be a witness, to be your witness, God. Continue to be with us as we learn more from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, we'll go for a break and we'll meet after.